Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the IFAM webinar series. Uh, I'm Ron Ackerman, the director for the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, and I have a distinct pleasure today of uh, the opportunity to reflect on the past year, uh, our fiscal year of 2020, and some incredible things that have happened, as well as um, uh, incredible work by members of our institute that I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is an opportunity to reflect as well as to share, uh, to ask questions. Uh, I'm gonna rattle through a lot of slides and the purpose is just to share information that I hope um, is uh, uh, helpful to, to, to reflect upon, to think about. Um, hopefully it'll generate conversation. Uh, I'd like to leave some time for that. Uh, if you're interested in asking questions, uh, please use the Q&A tab not the chat function uh, for this uh, particular presentation. If you use the chat, we won't be monitoring it uh, regularly, but the Q&A will come back to, if you have a question during the presentation, feel free to ask it using the Q&A. Uh, and we'll, we'll stop at the end and we'll, we'll go through as many of those as we possibly can. Um, and I apologize, of course, I get paged right as I'm starting. Give me a second to stop that. Um, so uh, with that, I will get started. And like I said, I'm gonna go at a pretty fast pace here, but uh, please do ask questions. Um, I'm gonna give a bit of an overview first of, uh, of the year in review in terms of uh, people and things that have happened uh, in IFAM and then um, really take a look back at the year and some uh, quite exceptional things that have happened around us and, and the ways in which we've responded as an institute and continue to work towards. Um, I wanted to begin this year with just recognizing our incredible staff uh, in IFAM. Um, not all people who work with members in IFAM are staff of IFAM. We don't uh, necessarily hire and manage uh, those staff uh, within IFAM. Some of them are in departments, but we have over 120 individuals who are in IFAM and, uh, and we're we're proud of every one of them. We're proud of the staff that uh, that are appointed in departments and work with IFAM members on research and training. Um, these are the ones in the Institute. Um, it, it's just, uh, you know, we can't say uh, too much about any individual, but it's uh, definitely the truth that we could not accomplish what we do as an Institute, uh, continue to innovate uh, and do the incredible things we do, both in training and research. Uh, and work in the community without uh, these incredible staff. Um, I'll talk of, uh, about a few things that involve many of these individuals today, but I, I wanted to begin by just thanking them uh, because it really is, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the strength of the Institute comes from its member base and, and that includes um, students, trainees, staff, and faculty. Um, these are the values of the Institute. I just wanna put them up there again. I think, uh, I hope that they are, illustrated in the talk I'll give today and the information that I'm gonna share with you. Um, you can find these on our website with a deeper description about what we mean by these things. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's important to be reminded that uh, we, we exist as an institute and we uh, come together and we collaborate and work on things um, uh, both at Northwestern and outside uh, in the campus and the real world. Um, trying to demonstrate our values and to, uh, you know, do our work through our values. So um, I, I hope this, uh, this is uh, illustrated. I won't come back to this slide like I did last year, but I, I, I want to um, definitely begin with it because it guides really everything that we're doing, and I hope that becomes clear. Uh, I won't talk much about this side, but it's just to impress upon you that the Institute really is the uh, the sum of a lot of different centers, um, and uh, the centers do many different types of things. There's 16 of them now. One focuses on education and training, and the other, uh, the other 15 um, do a mix of other things. Some of them have training programs in them, but they uh, primarily focus focus on research and uh, administration of programs and and uh, service activities. Uh, we also provide directly support services in the way of um, finance, space management, uh, human resources, uh, in terms of uh, managing those 120 folks that we looked at before, as well as many others. Um, uh, membership, uh, communications, you see our IFAM webinar series, but also a lot of um, 
sort of weekly communications about opportunities and events. Um, there's shared services that we have like access to an EDW analyst and, um, and a variety of other things. Um, we've uh, provided leadership training, mentorship support, um, and, uh, and, and uh, of course, operate a large research administrative group, which I'll come back to. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the organization, but it's, it's big and, it, and we are the sum of all of these activities. And when I share the information with you today, it's about what our members are doing. It's, it's not me responsible or uh, IFAM central responsible. It is the, uh, uh, it's really a reflection and a celebration of, of the work of our members across all of these groups. Here's the leaders of our centers. Um, <clears throat> you know, these are faculty that are diverse and cut across um, multiple different departments and even schools on the Northwestern campus. Uh, we're, we're proud of this leadership and uh, it's an engaged leadership. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis uh, together to talk about strategy and uh, ways in which to um, uh, design um, activities that, that really uh, do reflect our values. Um, we all have different roles, we all do different things, um, but I think together uh, we help to, to sort of move the, the Institute forward uh, and to become part of, uh, you know, the really the broader the school and the university's response to a lot of things that are happening in the real world. So I'm proud to stand alongside these folks, as well as our, uh, our members and staff, uh, because it's, it's, it's uh, some of all of these parts that make the Institute of what it is. Not going to spend a lot of time on research growth, but it's good that our research volume continues to increase. This is the total amount of funding by year over the last five years um, amongst all of our members. Uh, over over 400 um, faculty members uh, currently listed in our member database. Not all of them uh, do research grants, but uh, regardless of where they put their grants or, or um, what the grants about, these are this is the funding of our membership. So uh, most of this work is going to be in the area of um, health services and outcomes and public and population health, community health, policy research, things that are beyond clinical trials, um, not really in the bench setting or the preclinical side. Um, there are some grants in here probably because there are some folks who do a little bit of both, uh, but this is largely a reflection of growth of public and population health research uh, at Northwestern and in the medical school. Um, it's, it's great to see this kind of growth. Um, it's not the only evidence that uh, we're successful, but it is something that the Dean's office and the school looks at. Um, it's part of rankings and other types of systems that we all see. Um, so it's good to see that we're able to produce research and that hopefully I'll communicate through the rest of my presentation that that research has real tangible value uh, for the communities that we serve and for the institution. I want to say just a short statement about our research administration. It's one of the largest research administrative groups on campus. Put through 145 proposals last year for $155 million. That's a lot of volume. We have, uh, we're, the, the group is managing 127 active awards uh, that amount to about $28 million. Uh, we manage the research administrative uh, services for three institutes now, the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, the Institute for Global Health, and the new uh, 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 Artificial Intelligence uh, Institute uh, run by Dr. Koh. Um, so it's, uh, it's a busy group and it, it uh, provides a service for all of those groups. Uh, they support 63 faculty and five trainees and, and we just have an incredible group of people. They're listed at the bottom. I wish I could say a lot more about all of them. Um, we're, we're proud of the group and, and proud of what they accomplished. Um, on the education side, we also continue to grow there. Uh, you can see the counts of the number of students in each of our master's programs. We operate through our Center for Education and Health Sciences, our Master of Public Health with four concentration areas. We have a Master of Science in Biostatistics as part of our program of public health as well. We also have separate master's programs in health services and outcomes research, health quality and patient safety. Uh, there's an integrated health sciences PhD program and postdoctoral fellowships that are funded through a variety of different mechanisms. Um, 244 trainees uh, through, uh, just through the uh, Center for Education and Health Sciences. Uh, we have record student enrollment this year for the MPH program. So our master's in public health is growing. 
uh, and 18 new students for our, our health services and outcomes research master's program. Um, so that's, that's great signs of people, new learners, new careers being developed in areas of public and population health. And hopefully um, they'll find mentorship uh, and be successful uh, as part of our institute or leaving our institute to do great things in other settings. I want to say a moment about um, just briefly, there's lots of innovative things about um, what's happening in our training programs. I want to point out that um, Leah Neumauer this year uh, received a national award from the Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health. So that's the national organization of accredited schools and programs. Uh, and she received the one and only Early Career Public Health Teaching Award. Um, she designs innovative curricula and um, co-directs the uh, global health concentration of the master's uh, degree program. Uh, we're really proud of Leah and uh, happy to recognize her. Um, just one additional thing that I'll, I'll come back to a bit later, but we're developing um, always sort of new forms of coursework. And I think with the given context in the world, it's important to recognize that uh, one of the things I, I think the master's programs got out uh, ahead of a bit was evaluating uh, really the types of training that the students in these programs receive around uh, structural racism and entrenched racism and, and history of that in, in Chicago. So um, there, we developed the course. The course can be shared across the different programs. That's certainly going to begin to be offered uh, in uh, the spring quarter of 2021 um, for, the, for the public health program, uh, as well as some of the other master's uh, programs I showed on the prior slide. Um, so that's one example of, of really trying to get out, uh, I think, in front of uh, what we need to do to be uh, training a better student and a more prepared public health career um, for, for the future. I want to recognize a few more investigators, some leaders, and some notable awards uh, in addition to what I just showed. I'd like to show people that um, really are just kind of beginning their career in research. Uh, and one way to do this is to look at new K awards. So these are career development awards. Um, the ones I'll show are funded independently by National Institutes of Health agencies and, or AHRQ. And um, we do have some institutional training programs. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but these folks all received uh, their first K award notice within the past about 13, 14 months uh, since I last prepared uh, last year's State of the IFAM address. Um, I can't go through them all, but I think they demonstrate that uh, we, we really are, uh, our members are doing incredible things, both in clinical settings and community settings, um, focusing on uh, disparities, vulnerable populations. Uh, they cut across, uh, you know, kids and adults. Uh, I think it's a great sign of um, uh, of, of development of, of, of the next generation of, of impactful researchers. Um, I'll, I'll say too that, uh, you know, Sharif and uh, Badawi and Anna Fishbein came out of our, uh, our K-12 um, program that we uh, have co here called New Patient, which is a patient-centered outcomes research training, a career development training program. And from that got independent K awards. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to see that uh, the program that we supported within uh, an IFAM center uh, has continued to, to sort of produce um, people who go on to have independent careers in research. Uh, two additional that didn't fit on the prior slide, but equally important would be uh, these two folks, Aaron uh, Paquette and uh, Anand uh, Srivastava. And um, again, uh, exemplifying, um, you know, a, a whole breadth of areas in our, in our uh, early career program. Um, the Accelerate K-12 program, which has been a new award the last year and a half, has provided funding for four trainees for the past almost two years. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, had an open cycle of competition and, and made some selections for further uh, K award applicants for the, for the program. Um, uh, we call Accelerate Learning Health System Training Program. Um, those those uh, appointments need to be approved by the funding agency, HRQ, so they're under review, so we can't say who they are or how many, but it's something that will continue to, uh, to fund K award applications and folks that are doing research with mentorship, uh, largely coming or partly coming at least from IFAM. Um, these folks are people that, that are first time R01 level awards. So, 
Um, they're, they're basically large independent research awards, uh, investigator initiated awards. Um, this is the first time these folks have had an award like that. So for many other folks with pilot grants and foundation funding, and that's all really important um, as well. We, we can't summarize all of it on a slideshow. Um, but, uh, you know, wanted to kind of recognize that some of these folks that come out of K programs and other training programs here in the Institute or, or with some of our uh, members uh, have gone to what is now considered really their own independent research programs. And we're excited for each and every one of those, again, reflecting um, a great sort of span across departments and different content areas. Some of these folks have received seed grants. Um, uh, like Adam had a C grant from our Center for Community Health a few years back, and he had two of them. Uh, Howard Kim came out of a K-12 program uh, for new patient again, so another person who came out of that program. Um, so we're, we're excited about all of these folks and excited that we continue to, to, to sort of help uh, new investigators start their careers. We also have new faculty, new to IFAM. Um, Tara Lagu is a hospitalist. She's going to be joining us from uh, uh, UMass and Bay State, Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, she is uh, really an exceptional uh, leader and creative person that uh, is going to come and direct our Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research. Uh, she actually starts next week. We're really excited about that. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about her when I get to her leadership slide. Uh, Lisa Lombard uh, is a, uh, a clinical psychologist who focuses on uh, mind-body interventions for kids and is working in uh, with the uh, Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research. Marianne Mason is a sociologist, an expert in social determinants of health and community equity, and has been working in that space a long time, has been a partner uh, and uh, involved in uh, ARC, the Alliance for Research, for several years as a, as a member of the faculty over at um, uh, at, at Lurie Children's Hospital and uh, came into the, as an associate professor in the School of Medicine, the D Department of Emergency Medicine this past year. Um, she's doing some great work uh, involved in the uh, Bueller Center for Health Policy and Economics, focuses on uh, violence and obesity prevention, a lot of uh, related areas. Uh, Marquita Lewis Thames is a, a new faculty member who joined us from a training program at Wash U in St. Louis. Prior to that, she was in Alabama, UAB. She is interested in rural health disparities and uh, African American um, health disparities. Um, her, her interest in rural health uh, has focused uh, on cancer survivorship and a variety of other areas. And she recently got a pilot grant. Um, from the uh, Respiratory Health Association, looking at lung, uh, lung cancer survivorship disparities in rural settings. David Leibowitz is a, uh, is a um, general internist and an informaticist, and uh, he's, he's uh, been involved in quality improvement and uh, system improvement uh, using electronic health records and other tools that involve informatics in the, in the clinical delivery setting. Uh, he comes back to us actually, he was at uh, Feinberg a number of years ago and came back to us recently from the University of Chicago. So we're excited to have him working in CHIP, uh, the Center for Health Information Partnership. I wanna recognize some awards and um, you know, uh, tomorrow won our, uh, our Institutional uh, Mentor of the Year Award, I, I think it was last year. And uh, this year won a, a similar national award from the American Society of Nephrology as a distinguished mentor. Uh, Melissa Simon and Carl Bill Amoria, um, many of you who know them, the very passionate, uh, very engaged mentors uh, who, who are uh, involved with a lot of junior uh, folks in, in the Institute. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Melissa's, uh, one of Melissa's training programs in a, in a moment. Uh, but they both uh, were uh, received this year's Mentor of the Year Award for the school. Uh, I want to recognize all three of those as, um, uh, you know, really strong uh, IFAM members and, and um, leaders as well as mentors. Some additional awards that were notable, uh, Abel Ko and Yuan Lu uh, received a new, a new investigator award. Uh, well, Luan, Luan, Yuan got a new investigator award. Abel's was a... Um, Innovation and Informatics Award, both from the American um, uh, Medical Informatics Association. Um, uh, Teresa Walnus uh, received, uh, she was uh, awarded as a fellow of the American Medical Informatics Association. Uh, Charles Nika Evans um, uh, received a uh, 
a research career scientist award from the VA. Um, this is a, a award you only get after you've been an accomplished uh, uh, independent scientist and it protects your time for five years to mentor and to lead and to um, get involved in higher level activities of leadership. Uh, in, in, so we're, we're excited for her and, and the opportunities this creates for her, um, both at the VA and also as a member for Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research. And then I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, David Sella and, and Bill Grobman, uh, both members of IFAM Centers, uh, were both uh, in the past year, um, Dave last year and, and Bill this year, both elected to the National Academy of Medicine, which is amongst uh, really some of the highest honors one can receive for uh, research uh, and leadership in, 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 um, in academic uh, medicine. Uh, particularly on, on the clinical medicine side. So that's that's exciting um, that, that we're able to celebrate their award. Um, coming back to Tara, I just wanted to say, um, we have a couple of new leadership positions and Tara is one of those. She, as I said, she's coming to lead the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research. Um, you know, Tara is, uh, it, it'll be great. It's too bad we can't all sit down and she could stand up and we could see who she is. and talk to her afterwards. Uh, we're, we're just in not, not that kind of world right now. But I'd encourage you to reach out to her and, and uh, if you have similar interests, she's interested in chronic disease and care transitions and outcomes of care um, for people with uh, complex medical conditions. She's got a couple of grants now that focus on heart failure uh, and improving health and improving care transitions for people with heart failure. She's also done research about health systems and when they fall short for people with disabilities uh, and how to improve them. So I think uh, she'll um, have some good collaborations with other folks here that are already interested in some of those areas. Um, you know, the Center for Health Services now comes is really one of our largest centers um, and we're excited to have Tara. She's, she's an award winner and, and really, really a great person. I'm glad that she's coming here to lead this center and to, uh, uh, to, to sort of uh, begin a new a new phase uh, for that center and, and their growth. Um, we also uh, earlier in the year had a had kind of a rebirth for our Center for Epidemiology and Population Health. Uh, it's led now by Nori Allen, uh, who's in our um, Department of Preventive Medicine and Epidemiology. Um, the, the, the group is beginning with uh, some established strengths and uh, Nori is leading uh, a program of uh, data linkages and how you bring data together. And um, John Wilkins does something slightly related in data pooling. And it's, you know, how do you put together cohort studies, different cohort studies to, to sort of ask and answer questions about um, differences in health outcomes and um, uh, long-term health for, for people and cohort studies that are across different race and ethnic groups. and different parts of the country. Um, and then Kiari Kershaw runs a program on social epidemiology and uh, measuring and evaluating health impacts related to social environments. Uh, so uh, she does work uh, and has done some primary data collection and also secondary analysis and geospatial analysis of, of, uh, of uh, things like chronic stress and social relationships and, and uh, nutrition and obesity and how, it, how it's uh, related in Chicago neighborhoods. Um, so we're really excited by the growth uh, and, and further evolution of this center. Um, our Center for Education also has new leadership. Um, we had a national search, or not a national, but a, a, a local search. And we really felt like we had several good leadership candidates here um, uh, for, for this position. And we had a, a rigorous search process, search committee, and uh, several very good applicants that uh, finally uh, got to the point of uh, selecting Neil as a permanent director for the center. Uh, we're excited by his, uh, his leadership vision and uh, what, what, um, uh, what he hopes to, to do as we continue to improve these programs and try to grow and evolve in ways that are more innovative and, uh, and uh, allow the center to continue growing. Um, one of the centers I announced last year, which was our Center for Applied Health Research on Aging, we established that in 2019, um, submitted a P30 uh, center grant award, that's a core center, to the National Institutes on Aging, and they got that award this year. Uh, they are one of 13 PEPPER centers in the United States, and the center will focus on improving primary care for older adults that have multiple medical conditions. 
Uh, it integrates some strengths here at Northwestern, um, including some clinical geriatric strengths and work in health literacy, um, health education literacy, uh, and um, also um, decision science and self-management and behavior. Um, the, uh, interestingly, the center runs a pilot grant program with rather large grants. So you're, if you're interested in aging research and collaborative aging research, you really look into it. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, it also has um, the equivalent of really some training grant awards uh, where junior investigators can get engaged and learn to be rigorous uh, scientists in the area of, um, of uh, aging research. So I would, uh, I, I would uh, look into that if you're interested. Uh, the center is led by uh, Michael Wolf and, and uh, he, he leads CARA. Um, and then um, Jeff Linder was co-PI of, uh, of the P30 submission uh, on that award. Jeff is the division chief of general internal medicine and geriatrics. Um, so we're, we're excited for both of these guys to, to bring this award uh, to CARA. Um, so I want to shift just a little bit now and I want to talk about, um, you know, there's a couple elephants in the room and it's really affected our work over the past year and that's how I'd like to spend the rest of my time. Um, one of those is the global pandemic of COVID-19 uh, and I, I just want to show firstly, um, you, you know, the, the surge we had here in Chicago and uh, mask wearing is just one example of how this has dr drastically impacted our lives. Um, we went home in March and we really haven't come back, many of us. Uh, certainly if we have come back, uh, life is a bit different <laughs> than it was in the past. And so this has dramatically impacted our lives, all of us. Um, lots has happened in the last uh, eight months, uh, nine months. We continue to have a lot of uncertainty about what will happen next and how long it will happen for. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit too about the fact that it doesn't affect everybody equally. And as we, um, are a uh, institute at a major academic medical center in the city of Chicago. Uh, we do a lot of work in the city of Chicago and with partners in the city. And we recognize the unequal burden of the burden of COVID on, uh, on, on our neighborhoods and uh, on different populations in the city. Uh, and a lot of that has become science, uh, but uh, it's also become uh, really uh, a focus of volunteerism and, and uh, service work and, and really anything we could do to help the community uh, as an academic institution to help the community to, to sort of get through this COVID ep epidemic and, and we still continue to, to work in that, in that path. Um, you know, this started early on and really in February to early March, um, there were a few groups that you know, got involved pretty quickly. We've got highlighted on the top ones a paper in the Lancet, which was published in uh, March. Uh, and uh, it, it's basically a report of the first known person to person transmission of COVID in, in the whole US. And uh, it was basically a, a really intensive contact uh, tracing and, and um, event tracing uh, exercise that involved three of our trainees in the, in the preventive medicine residency program that we operate in um, partnership with Cook County. Um, so that was uh, really exciting. And, and there were several other papers, people writing about how, uh, in, in leaders here at Northwestern writing about how, how COVID is transmitted and how it's disrupting care and lots of things that, uh, that were important at the time. Um, I'm only highlighting a couple here. The, the second paper I put up is, is really, uh, you know, uh, a, a group effort by several folks uh, working collaboratively with Mike Wolf and, and several of the other folks, um, uh, many of whom are, are members of IFAM that are listed in the author byline. Um, and it was really to say we've got engagement of existing populations or large groups of individuals through our research. Could we quickly do an IRB amendment and collect additional information about how COVID is affecting their lives? And um, this group, I, I put this up there because this group um, proposed these changes, did the IRB amendment, started the data collection, analyzed the data and got this paper in publication in a month. Um, so from concept to publication was a month. So although we always struggle and complain about how long it takes for evidence to hit the public domain, um, these people did something really timely and, and really quick just based on research and work and structures they already had in place. 
Um, and it's, it's really uh, miraculous, I think, to kind of think through how many of us in the Institute over the past year just said, well, this is something I'm doing. This is something I know. How can it be helpful for us as a society or a population to address COVID? Um, another example here is uh, there was a lot of action early in March, really late February, or early March around trying to mobilize people and share information about how we could get involved and how we can engage with public health partners. Some of that was organized uh, in the Center for Health Information Partnerships and it, it involved mobilizing data and people and partnerships throughout the city. We put up a web page, the Chicago COVID Coalition, it's still out there. It's got strategic goals and values and lots of resources and linkages to other things. Um, you know, there were uh, at, at one point probably over 300 uh, Northwestern faculty collaborating in some way uh, either communicating or participating in work groups of the coalition that did everything from modeling to uh, developing new data systems to trying to develop systems that would uh, allow the sharing of ventilators and, and other things to happen if we got so far that we, there were huge shortages of supplies um, throughout the throughout the city. So, um, you know, really a, an incredible thing. It's it's hard to encapsulate this all on a on a single slide, but uh, just wanted to kind of give a shout out to the group and Chip for the work that they did organizing this. Uh, Teresa and Abel and uh, lots of the staff. Uh, so many people were involved. It's hard to recognize everyone. Um, we did, uh, you know, quickly kind of shut down the the seminar series uh, as we went to the stay at home and and converted, got back up and running uh, about a month five weeks later as a webinar series. And we began by introducing some of the things coming out of the coalition and then other groups that were working on campus. Uh, Jalene Girardin, uh, who's in the Department of Preventive Medicine and has an affiliation with Global Health as well, um, has really been involved. She's an infectious disease modeler. She does agent-based modeling that directs policies or helps to guide policies for malarial containment in Africa. And she used her modeling skills and um, data that was uh, came started to come flowing from public sources, but also from IDPH um, through a data agreement that we developed uh, in just a few weeks. Um, and she developed some prediction models that have still continued to help inform the governor's office and, and other uh, decision makers in the state about the, sta the status of uh, COVID transmission and, and COVID threat. Um, so it's really become a tool to, uh, to inform policy uh, in concert with other, uh, with other uh, tools. Um, Kelly Michelson and Aaron Paquette uh, came and talked to us about the, the ethics of COVID-19 and, and it had us thinking a lot about uh, you know, um, decisions we really wouldn't wanna make, uh, like uh, who gets the ventilator if there's a ventilator uh, shortage. Um, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty at the time. Uh, different uncertainty than today, but uh, you know that this was uh, really an important thing. Um, and 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 then um, Judith Mos Moskowitz, um, you, you know, came and talked to us about anxiety and emotion and and coping with stress during the epidemic and and trying to identify uh, uh, positive uh, sort of strategies for for dealing with that and and um, sort of shining light on the fact that uh, you know the social isolation had dramatic impacts for people and um, and and not equally you know uh, people that are more socially isolated or different parts of the city or, or due to advanced age really were uh, extremely vulnerable um, Mike Wolf talked about his uh, development of uh, the data collection through those cohort studies that I described before and and uh, Sadia Khan and, and John Wilkins came and talked to us about, uh, you know, our understanding for um, how many people have been infected and the distribution uh, uh, and disparities associated with COVID-19 throughout the city. Um, so that's just an example of some of the presentations and uh, some of the folks who were involved. Um, Rob Murphy, you know, uh, used to direct our Center for Global Health and now the Institute for Global Health, uh, but, uh, but an ISAM member. And uh, he uh, was interviewed numerous times, in this case, uh, Chicago Sun-Times, really about the virus and the transmission and, and how to contain it and, and how our policies were, were working or not working. Uh, Catherine Belling in our Center for Bioethics uh, was interviewed uh, for an article in Time Magazine about anxiety uh, around COVID-19. Uh, Lori Post uh, interviewed on WGN Radio about uh, protecting victims of abuse, you know, um, 
the vulnerability of people that were um, already at a high risk for domestic violence, um, you know, just shining light that that increases when people are contained in the same household and, uh, and, and uh, you know, support structures become limited. Mercedes Carnathon, uh, you know, um, was also interviewed a number of times. Here she's a guest on the 11th hour on MSNBC, uh, talking about the increase in COVID-19 in Arizona. Uh, and Nami Kandula, uh, you know, was interviewed by uh, Associated Press and they produced this uh, video um, really highlighting the excess mortality in Asian Americans and just the paucity of data and the ability to understand and act on the issue. Uh, the story was uh, picked up and, and published in, in venues like the New York Times, USA, US News and, and World Report. Um, Chicago Tribune and uh, several other news lines. Um, so we're really excited about the, the activity and the ability to like get out and share the information in ways that were usable um, and to drive policy and to help um, uncover deeper issues about COVID. Um, the Center for Community Health uh, in collaboration with others uh, developed this uh, Chicago COVID-19 resource repository. It has an abundance of links and files and information that's helpful uh, to um, just about anybody who wanted to understand and take action uh, regarding COVID. Um, still up, it's still running. You can find it from the website there. Um, you, you can even add information to it. So uh, it continues to be useful as COVID continues. Um, CCH and, and the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma also developed this uh, response and recovery grant program and had participation collaboration from others as well. Um, they've awarded to date, I believe, 28 um, uh, or funding to 28 uh, nonprofits uh, across the city. Here's a map of where they're located. A couple examples of recent awards on the page. Um, you know, really, it's to it's it's to um, provide these organizations with sources of information, um, tools, resources to help um, either collect data or respond locally or take action to um, uh, to to build some capacity to to address COVID at a local uh, at a local level. Um, you can see that program also on the uh, our, on the um, uh, Center for Community Health or or CFAR uh, website. Uh, I want to pivot just a little bit. I'll come back to COVID um, slightly, but just uh, I, I have to spend a couple moments just, uh, you know, talking about the um, really the recognition of a pervasive other pandemic uh, and one that's been going on at least 400 years, really, that's just, uh, you, you know, uh, kind of highlights that, uh, you know, this, uh, unlike COVID, is not recent. Uh, but it's come to our attention in deeper and um, more pressing ways over the past year. Um, you know, the issue of uh, deaths of, of uh, African-Americans at, at the hands of people sworn to serve and protect uh, is, uh, is absolutely uh, intolerable. It's a public health crisis. And, um, you know, we're on a path to try to figure out how to reverse uh, the structural racist policies that underlie a lot of uh, a lot of the inequities and the injustices that, that that are part of this, and that also affect uh, other other groups across our population. Some of our research has been focused in these areas for a while, but there were a lot of things that happened this year. Um, you know, in, in, in many ways, an awakening to, to take different forms of action, to um, elevate the immediacy of the importance of acting now and, and really looking in the mirror at ourselves and at our own institutions. And, um, you know, this continues to be a work in, process, in, in progress. And, um, and uh, hopefully it's, uh, you know, not something that we allow to become quiescent and uh, continue to work towards uh, goals of uh, achieving health equity for all and uh, social justice uh, for um, really so many populations. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it, it's incredible um, to look at these and be reminded as, and, and be hopeful that we're not looking at another occurrence of, uh, you know, a um, 
senseless death at the hands of people sworn to protect or, or um, but, there, but there's so many other subtle forms of, of racism that we, we need to address. And like I said, uh, I'm not here to provide the answers, but here to show some, some of the ways the Institute is uh, creating dialogue, trying to be uh, part of a process for change and trying to highlight um, and get behind and support uh, the populations most affected by uh, by these injustices. Um, so, you know, I, I got to highlight really up front, uh, our Center for Health Equity Transformation has really stepped up and taken a lead role in, in many, many different ways and really had been doing this and shining light even before, um, uh, you know, the, the murder of, of George Floyd and, and um, you know, uh, there's, I'll show some of those things, but uh, has developed this website, which has just a wonderful repository of um, readings, videos, movies, um, uh, events, other sources of information, things to, to be educated, to be enlightened, to connect, to act. Um, and it's really organized nicely and uh, easy to find. I would encourage you if you haven't to spend time. I mean, if everybody on the call you know, spend, um, you know, eight hours in the next, uh, you know, month or two, just just exploring some of these resources. It's, it's, it's really a, um, a way to uh, awaken. And, and if, you, if, you know, it's unfortunate that we're not thinking about some of these things. I, I, I think the Center for Health Equity Transformation and several others in the Institute do think about these things every day. But unfortunately, not everybody does. And that's part of the problem. So, um, make a note to visit this, make a note to be engaged in this. And um, I think you'll find it really um, helpful in helping you understand how it is something under everybody's control and, and, a, and there's a way for everybody to become involved. Um, Chet has held these Chet Chat spotlights. They've done a number of events where they brought in um, community leaders or folks um, around, or, or they've even talked about a movie. Uh, or a book or something. And, and some of these are collaborative presentations. You can see the descriptions there, um, but really focusing on historical context of racism and health disparities in Chicago, uh, the impact of COVID on the black community of Chicago. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, how do we um, uh, recognize, understand, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and develop solutions for uh, for structural racism and, uh, and, and replace racist policies with anti-racist policies. It's, it's just uh, great to get involved in these, pay attention to these. Um, uh, like I said, we, we need to constantly remind ourselves and remain engaged that it's just intolerable um, that this is a problem just we, we haven't yet solved. Um, there was also a celebration held by the center uh, for Juneteenth, uh, you know, recognition of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, freed, uh, freedom from slavery, uh, you know, many years after, uh, after abolishment of, of, sl of slavery. Uh, and, it, you know, it's, it's not a national holiday yet, but probably will become one at some point. I just want to point out this was a nice virtual event, a way to connect around and remind and, and sort of, um, uh, really understand a, a bit more about um, uh, about the importance of this recognition and what it means today. And this was led by two of the T37 trainees in Center for Health Equity Transformation, uh, Carmen Isha Ward and Danielle Wishard. And um, they did a wonderful job moderating and, um, you know, the production was great. And I, I really just want to congratulate them. Um, I, I look forward to continue to see a lot of um, these things continue. It's just, it's just really an important vehicle to uh, engage and, and to continue to have dialogue. Um, the, uh, I, I want to say too, many of you are aware that, uh, you know, several student groups and faculty and other folks around campus uh, went to the school and said, you know, what are you going to do about it? What, what's happening? Um, and ask uh, ask for a, a formal evaluation or or process for investigating <clears throat> sources of injustice, inequity, institutional racism at Feinberg. And um, the dean received these recommend these these recommendations and and uh, and called for four advisory groups. Um, 
you know, one of them is about how we use information about race and the way we deliver care to individuals um, in clinical settings. And, and that gets back to how we teach students and trainees um, to how you think about a patient. Um, you know, uh, the, the goal here is to eliminate bias from the way that we practice medicine and to make sure that everybody is treated um, equally and equitably. And, uh, and so this committee delved into how race is used in laboratory test interpretation or treatment of particular conditions and whether and when that's ever appropriate or not. And they've made some recommendations. Um, there's one about evaluation bias uh, and that includes grading and how we give out awards for things like uh, AOA or high achievement uh, medical students and, and other trainees. Um, so how will, we, how will we ensure that that's equitable? A third was strengthening our community engagement and that one was co-chaired by Melissa Simon and myself. I involved many of you and IFAM as well as community partners. I think we're the only um, group that had uh, community partners on our, on our committee. I was excited about that. And uh, we also made recommendations. Um, you know, I can talk more about that if there's questions, but uh, we are waiting now. We delivered those recommendations. Each committee was asked to do the top three assembled into 12 recommendations that the Dean's office has been considering how best to respond to them. And I know that they're close to making a statement about, um, you know, what was received and, and how to address them, these issues. Um, I don't think it's out yet unless an email came out today that I didn't see when I was in uh, patient care this morning, but uh, it should be coming out pretty soon. Uh, but again, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Drawing to a close, I just want to give a couple more examples about our focus on community and health equity. Um, just a great partnership that's been developed with Alliance for Research in Chicagoland Communities and Columbia College's public narrative. Um, it's been recognized and uh, by several groups now is really innovative and it's a way to build relationships um, and to try to develop ways in which um, uh, ethnic media outlets, how can they, community and ethnic media outlets be effective strategies for sharing information um, about, uh, um, uh, about knowledge or research or other information that can help um, to address health disparities um, and, uh, and, and health decision-making at a local level. Um, I mentioned before a couple of times the, the training program in Center for Health Equity Transformation. This is really an incredible program, the NUMHRT, uh, Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Training Program. Uh, it's a five-year grant. Uh, it funds, uh, has funded so far 15 trainees uh, from undergraduate to postdoctoral. They don't have to be here. They can be in other parts of the country. They receive mentorship and a network of support. Um, it's really an incredible program. I want to commend uh, Melissa and everybody who's involved in it. Uh, the trainees are exceptional. Um, it, it makes us better. And I hope we can find ways that um, we, we bridge these types of programs as people matriculate from these programs and have such incredible skills that some of them are prepared to go back to community settings or, or leadership in, in public agencies or communities. But if they're staying in academia, do we have a way to continue to develop um, uh, their own career development through other training programs and, and ways of mentoring? And I, and I wanna think about these programs in the context of a, you know, a, a portfolio of resources that the Institute can use to try to diverse, uh, diversify and strengthen um, our, our uh, future leaders. Um, this Chad also developed this health equity footprint, which is like a catalog or registry of investigators and teams at Northwestern who do work in health equity. Here's an example of Elisa Gordon. She's one of the people that came up when, when we went in, uh, looked at it recently. Um, and, and she does work in organ donation and, um, you know, for uh, particularly for uh, Lat Latinx uh, communities and um, so, I, you know, I, I would encourage you to look at this. If you're a health equity researcher, you're not listed there, I'd encourage you to, to get involved and have your information there. It's a way for people to discover you. It's a way for mentors to connect with mentees and people to identify collaborators or opportunities to, to act. Um, you know, this is something small. It's really the, uh, you know, the, the web tool and uh, that we develop for community engagement and a vehicle where monthly there's a group of leaders in 
across NM centers and different parts of, uh, of Feinberg. And then also um, the, the health systems like uh, Northwestern Memorial Healthcare and NMH, the hospital, um, Lurie Children's, uh, there's some upper campus, uh, you know, folks from Evanston campus that participate, government, government affairs. Um, what we do is we share information about pressing issues in our work in the community and what our goals are and whether there's opportunities to connect and coordinate resources. Um, we uh, did an inventory of all the places where those partnerships are currently in place and plotted them and there's a color code there. Those are all the different participating groups. Um, we'd like to use this over time as a platform to continue to share information about volunteering activities. And um, I, I hope this group becomes a, a vehicle to increasingly connect and to identify places where we, um, we collectively work together and in concert with the same partners to really bring about meaningful community change, rather than that there might be separate groups working in the same communities on different issues and sometimes with the same partners, but not in a way that's coordinated. So it is an opportunity, something in, in motion, something that continues to need to evolve, but we continue to work on that and I'm, I'm excited to be part of it. Um, another thing, the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research, um, you know, is uh, initially supported by uh, one of the uh, Rapid Impact Grants uh, I was shown before, um, developed and hosted a program that brought together 95 CPS high school students from 16 schools um, and it, it talked about how to be change makers and um, uh, connected with uh, them with health professionals from NU and Lurie to hear about uh, their journeys. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a way to sort of get people interested and engaged and empowered to make a difference. Um, out of this, uh, they created uh, uh, 11 PSAs and 70 posters uh, and came out of it with a lot of ideas of how to improve awareness and outcomes in their own schools and communities. So another good example of uh, engagement. Um, this is a seed grant program, uh, goes into mostly um, community uh, primary care settings. And um, like a lot of the Center for Community Health and some of the other prior practice-based research uh, research funding. This is co-sponsored by uh, Department of Medicine and, and other groups as well. But it requires a community and academic collaborator or co-PI. And you can see that there's a variety of different activities that in this case focus on health systems and access to care and how do we improve outcomes and access from our health system strengths. Alliance for Research in Chicago Lake Communities, I've mentioned that a couple times. The one thing I want to mention on this slide, other than that they also have just a tremendous seed grant program, um, over a million dollars awarded in 13 rounds over the past 11 years or so. Um, I want to say that they're hiring a community co-director, which is just really powerful. So this is somebody who's going to co-direct the whole alliance. And the alliance is governed and steered by a community academic steering committee. Um, but Jen has been director of that and uh, she's very centered on community and very engaged in the work that she does. Um, but she's uh, going to do this collaboratively with a community co-director, which I just think is really um, uh, the way that we need to move in terms of developing programs that are designed uh, with community vote, community voice, and, and genuinely to make a difference in, in the community. I want to call it the Masala study because it made 10 years this year of collaborative research and it focuses on vulnerable South Asian communities, um, a lot of which are first, second generation individuals and has um, in a variety of different ways shown um, the existence of, of really important health disparities and cardiovascular and other areas that really were unrecognized in the past. And um, Nami Kandula and members of her team continue to work um, uh, in, in collaboration with Masala investigators. Um, it's exciting that this partnership has lasted 10 years. I wanna stop for just a moment before I end uh, to recognize Jenny Bishop. Uh, Jenny was just an amazing person. Um, she was the uh, co-director uh, early on of ARC and, uh, you know, worked a lot in community, was a fierce advocate for, um, for so many uh, areas around social justice and health equity and community um, empowerment. 
Um, she, uh, you know, worked toward the end of her career in, in the program of public health and, and really was uh, also had an appointment in, in uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, uh, just a fierce advocate and an incredible person, um, honest to the bone and just a uh, beautiful uh, leader in public health. And uh, we lost her uh, to a battle with cancer in the last year. And uh, I just wanted to, to recognize her one more time. Um, you know, we should all aspire to be as strong as she was uh, and leaders in the way that she, she led. Um, we have this series of uh, explorations and career of public health. Um, you know, we've had three, just uh, two incredible lectures so far with Linda Ray Murray and um, Ngozi Azike, uh, just wonderful. If you, if you didn't tune into these, you should view them on our website and definitely tune into David Ansel, which is coming up soon. Um, these are a great series of trying to kind of inspire and show how these people ended up in careers of public health and I hope create um, a visible pathway for many of you. We're doing something similar at the intersection of translational science in new cats uh, and public health. And these are people interested in public and population health and surveillance and epi and lots of things happening in public health settings with Nick. Uh, and they're also uh, heavily involved in new cats. So it's another way of showing the intersection of kind of transdisciplinary research. Um, I'll quickly wrap up the Population Health Forum. Uh, would normally be happening here in the fall, but we had decided to push it to the spring earlier in the year because um, uh, we're, we're trying to avoid getting too close to research day at Northwestern and that got moved to the fall. Both events, uh, well, the fall events got canceled this year, but uh, we're, we're still planning on uh, a focus on health equity and uh, on, a, on a virtual program that we'll hold in the spring of 2021. So we're excited about that and hoping to replicate the incredible program that we had with partnership and, and uh, presentations by uh, CDPH and national leaders in, in health equity research. I'll leave you with a message to vote. Um, obviously, that's the time is now, <laughs> if you haven't already. Uh, regardless of how you feel, it's how, it's how you influence um, what's gonna happen next with, uh, with policy and with uh, secular events that, uh, that are so important to the work that we do and, and the health of our population. So I'd encourage everybody to, to definitely take that action. And um, I just wanna add to that, we're not done with any of this. You know, obviously this is, uh, continues to be a work in progress. Um, we can't be done. It's, uh, you know, there's so many problems unsolved and, uh, I look forward, I'm inspired by so many of all of you, and I look forward to continuing this work and trying to find better ways to address these problems as we continue to move forward in the coming year. So with that, um, I am not seeing anything in the q and I did see some, some stuff in the chat, um, just some information I think that people were sharing with the group. Um, you know, we are at the top of that hour. Um, the, uh, looks like there was a couple of things that uh, were asked that we answered administratively, um, uh, just uh, sharing information about some of the information on the slides. Um, I think that's probably it, if there's no questions. I really appreciate everybody tuning in today. I hope that um, I didn't miss anybody or anybody feels slighted, I can't highlight everything, but I, I just wanted to point out examples of the wonderful work we're doing. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody who's been part of IFAM this year and continues to move these, uh, these important areas forward. Thank you.